Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this interview with the wonderful uh, Johan, who ran Watch the Skies uh, online uh, today, who has uh, very uh, thankfully joined us after being slightly frazzled by running uh, a game <laughs> today. So uh, a big round of applause for Johan, please, uh, from everyone. So we want this to be as interactive as possible. So any questions you've got for, for Johan as he says things, uh, please uh, pop them in to the to the questions uh, because it would be great to to see all of those okay okay and and uh ed says woo johan hey woo, woo, woo yeah. indeed <laughs> so uh for i'm sure the very few people who don't know who you are who are you johan oh i am about a million years old um <laughs> feeding off mega gamers energy to <laughs> sustain me through the ages now um i run um mega games for um gothenburg mega games uh which is now more or less an online thing <laughs> since since the past year of pandemic we've run um Den of wolves two times and we've run watch the skies two times last watch the skies run we had 91 players um because i like to challenge myself i guess <laughs> <laughs> and and this run was uh i think around 60 players which was um, a, a more manageable feat i think <laughs> um but we we do run games and um i think we've we've tried to adapt well to like the online format um and uh can't wait to get back to to um flesh mega games but uh but uh, i i do think that that there is uh, a real space to to keep doing stuff online um and even do hybrid stuff i think the future is very very interesting yeah okay well thank you very much so i normally want to do these i ask the person to explain what the game is but with watch the skies i don't really think that's that's quite as necessary i think a lot of people will have played uh, watch the skies or, or heard kind of watch the, the skies but there are some interesting additions uh to the game for the version that johan runs uh in terms of the economy model uh for the game and some changes to science which i think are the two big ones johan yeah as changes so they're well worth us diving into in quite a bit of detail and we'll tackle the economy one first because the economy is a, a big thing in in all mega games that quite often uh goes wrong uh but your hand seems to to work every time i've uh, seen or heard about it so which is big props to your hand so your hand your economy module yeah well basically it's um it is the same economy module uh that is used for the watch the skies light version that you can get out of the box but it is in excruciating detail rather than being able to sign a trade deal um for two extra um economy mega bucks each turn um we dive into excruciating detail of the complexity of that nation's economy um giving uh, players a chance to both see the sort of what what trading goes on and what's already there, which is interesting to have a sort of background and and gives you it fleshes out your um, your nation in a different way uh, where you have like you have a real feel for the, is this an oil trading nation or is this a um, highly technological pharmaceutical nation what what is it is it but do we produce food that sort of stuff then there's the chance to boost your economy just like in um the, the watch the skies light version where you can make trade deals with others but that is based off a of uh, you can't just trade with anyone you can trade for, with someone who has what you need but it also gives the idea that came up was uh in watch the skies for those who have played like the the normal flesh version uh of, of the game uh uh, America and China and the big nations, they're very strong. They're strong because they're, they're, um, they have, they're, they're strong militarily. Um, so they have a lot of forces, they have nukes, all that good stuff. Um, and the economy offers a way to sort of go at them 
um, without having to use military force. And uh, in today's game, for instance, uh, the US fell halfway through the game because they, their economy just tanked. Uh, and that was because various reasons for, for um, one part was sloppy trading and another part was um, the other nations actually going after them, cancelling trade deals, uh, doing embargoes, that sort of stuff. Um, and that had big consequences. So US basically had a military coup and uh, that was solely because of the economy tanking. Um, big nations like, like China, the same goes there. It's a, it's a way of going after the big guys. And you, not a, a single nation can't go after them. But if the entire game decides to go after them, they will tank, they will fall, just like in the real world. So it, it adds some sort of complexity to the economy, which I think makes it interesting for players. It also makes for interesting plots game because uh, you can track uh, stuff moving through the game. So for instance, in today's game, uh, the aliens infected Brazil with some sort of alien bug that attacked the crops, but Brazil was exporting food stuff to uh, China and through to Russia. So that bug spread throughout the game through the trading module. So it's a way to sort of follow up on on different uh, transactions throughout the game and just fleshes out the economy in an interesting way. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and so what were your kind of inspirations when you were designing uh, that? Sadly enough, real world economy, I think. <laughs> I think the, the, the major thing was when uh, the, the idea came up uh, when Trump was president and decided to go after China in a trade war. And yeah. I thought that is really interesting. This is not the Cold War. This is something else. How can we model that in a game in order to make it interesting? Uh, and that was the start of it. Then everything in Watch the Skies um, is an abstraction of, of real world um, things. So like military strength is abstracted off of real world data. That's what Jim has done an excellent job of doing. It's based on what teams are played. It's the G8. Um, and we've added on top of that with new teams and stuff. So we've used like real world economy data to model this, uh, the complexity of the economy and all that good stuff. And, and we made it into, that sounds like it's super, super complicated, but we abstracted that down to um, basically uh, playing spider solitaire, which is basically a, 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 board, a board where you place cards on. Um, and it, the complexity is underneath it and handled by control. And all players have to do is, is basically try to solve the solitaire and and that's it. And and if you do a good job of that, your economy is going to be fine. But once you start pulling the threads, it ripples through the entire system. Yeah. Okay. And from players you've had who have played kind of vanilla Watch the Skies and your Watch the Skies, what have their comments kind of been on the economy? Because it's a, a big departure basically from a PR board where essentially you try to do stuff in the media to get your PR up and every now and again there's a card that puts your PR up and that's really the, the complexity of the economy in, in vanilla Watch the Skies kind of yeah. done there. Uh, we've only received, uh, well, when we, when we uh, try this the first time around in, in uh, uh, proper game we like you do as a game designer you try out different things and you try to find your way of um, uh, modeling mechanics i guess um, and the mistake that we did was we everything had to go through control um, so it was signing papers handing stuff in um, and, and um, once we changed that and we had to actually pause the game for 30 minutes to just handle the first two turns of, of trading interactions and having two controls being completely overwhelmed by, by, the, by the system, it is now literally you have these cards. It, there's a limited amount of cards. You can move them around, but you can never... So the, the, the abstraction is that they are, they are, this is an export deal you can export this to China, or you can not export it to China and export it to somebody else. It's yeah. it, it, it's it's an either or kind of um, uh, situation. And we've only had like what when we've done it um, properly after the first time, we've only had 
praise for it and uh, online as well people get the hang of it they understand it it's easy easy to track your trade uh, globally it's easy to understand how you can use it to your advantage and to other place disadvantage yeah okay that sounds great and if anyone has the chance to check it out i definitely recommend doing so so any questions on the economy pop those through but let's move on to science yes and, uh, this and is, the big change made to science yeah this is probably the most interesting topic i think because when we got um before our first run of vanilla watch the skies um my group sat down and we looked at the game, tried to figure out what it is, how are we going to run it. We decided first to take a stab at rewriting the whole thing, then decided against it. One of the things we couldn't understand was what makes the science game fun and interesting. And then we handed it over to one of our control who basically ran it like a LARP, um, which is a very big step away from the very sort of mechanical tech tree uh, and it gives players a very sort of creative environment of do whatever you want kind of thing um, that works for some for some players but is very intimidating for players who need some sort of structure to yeah. to uh, adhere to so uh, for my uh, job we do uh, loads of workshops all of that has moved online now so I pitched an idea a very rough idea to uh, to Darren um, who is a very talented mega game designer and he sort of helped me build on that uh, most of the work was done by him and Alex Vince uh, in just making the structure the, the 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 idea that I had was well what is what is what would be a reasonable abstract, uh, how, how a reasonable way to abstract science and scientific work? Well, it's basically putting the man hours into something and discussing ideas with other people. So yeah. we, uh, and the, the core concept for science in What's the Sky's Vanilla is the science conference, as it's called. So why not make that into a sort of an, an innovation workshop instead? Um, and the more players spend time on ideas, working on them together, uh, and with doing stuff online, this is something that we we have only tried to do online. It works so much better online. You could do it offline as well with the same principles, but basically gathering around a blank piece of paper and then just adding bits and clues from the game and building on on ideas and never saying no and all these that all these ideas that some people might recognize from like innovation workshops or uh, design thinking, that sort of stuff, and just riff off each other and then uh, getting something out of every session. So it's not endless sort of discussion, but you get something tangible that can affect the outcome of other parts of the game. Um, so it's divided into, uh, it, and it is basically a tech tree. You start out with the basic level but then creativity takes over so if player wants to um, spend time working on military advancements okay how many players want to do that okay out of the 13 players we had today maybe five want to do that then that that part of the tech tree uh, gets amplified by the power of five since there are five people working there so you get faster progression in the places where people spend uh, the resources of, of, of time. So uh, where you spend your agency basically uh, gets your results. So that's yeah. the basic idea. And then um, since we're doing stuff online, we've got the resources to uh, control can have, like they can make cards on the fly, that sort of stuff that's very hard to do um, unless you have like blank cards and scribble on pieces of paper, which is, could be fun as well to do in, in a regular mega game. You can actually get, pretty nicely designed cards that are based off of the ideas, which is also sort of a um, reward for engaging in the game. You get this card, it's, it has a, an effect, it has a name, you named it. it it's sort of a bespoke trading card kind of, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's a, a really interesting idea there, basically, as a, a game resource being player time yeah. and an agency. And so I, I like that. So I, I also LARP as well as doing you know, make games. Do you think there's rooms in other mechanical areas to basically 
move towards that style of thing. So I know Trope High had it where literally your, your time was a currency you, yeah. you spent to, to action, using kind of time and agency as a mechanic to drive at different game points. So you get, in theory, this more fluid experience for, for players rather than just interacting with a hard and fast set of rules. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. And, and since I think agency is probably the most valuable resource that we have in mega gaming, uh, since it's the biggest reward for engaging in a mega game is, is the sense of, of being able to um, impact the outcome of the game in some way, shape or form. So the more agency you invest, the more agency you get back to give to your teammates or, or allies or whatever. So I, I think that that has worked out really well. And we've had um, the problem we had with the first round of Watch the Skies was that the system was pretty much decided on the fly and the, the rules hadn't been outlined that clearly. So control had to do a lot more of herding cats than they yeah. had today. Today, the structure was there. It was clearly explained, well, as clearly as you can in rules, that, that's a different <laughs> subject. But um, nothing nothing but um, smiles and, and praise from the science players who, who were actually absolutely amazing today, but engaging in each other's ideas. And, and it is fun because you get the military alliances from the military players, which is based on um, tackling common um problems you get the same thing in the un where different players tackle sort of um crises and and we managed to achieve that in science as well because you got you're going after we're we're all interested in advancing uh in uh green energy or we're advancing in um teleportation or in uh, uh what was it today uh, trying to discover um, ancient ruins and growing tentacles. Uh, uh, sentient cod, I think, came up today as well. But it is where you invest the time. And it's also, I'm obsessed, absolutely obsessed with emerging narrative. And it's a very good way of gauging where is the interest from the players. If they are investing all of their time, all of their agency into sentient cod, who am I to say that that is a rubbish idea? If they're having fun with it, we can yeah. feed that into plot control. They can do all the sort of geopolitical nonsense that they are experts at doing. Uh, and the other players will, will get the benefits of that time invested as well. Yeah. That's an interesting one, which I'm kind of going back to. I'm going to go to the second of the questions we, we've got so far. So running from Ed Silverson, so running the science is a mostly freeform game. How to ensure that the outputs of the science game remain balanced with the other parts of the game? Um, it is basically based off of the... Um, the problems that they are facing in the rest of the game. The very few science projects uh, start off as an idea and an obsession to to do something specific that is game breaking, because very few, m most teams start out by saying we're going to nuke the moon or you know that sort of stuff. It is very hard uh, to get all the other scientists involved in that. If you turn up at a science conference and say, I'm going to nuke the moon, then the others are going to go, sure, you do that alone in your room, advance yeah. your advance your science by the factor of one, while we advance our science by the factor of 12, all of us in this other room. Yeah. And uh, after like five minutes of sitting alone in a room, that scientist is going to go, actually, let me engage in this bit first. Maybe then we can nuke the moon. Uh, and it, it involves every everyone in a in a common narrative. As for how to keep that in pace with the rest of the game, a lot of what we are able to do online is um, something that is hard to do in regular games, which is the intercommunication between control. So you can more, do more of what is called a, a, a hidden map. Uh, in a regular game where a bunch of controllers sat somewhere separate from the game and working out the uh, resolution of different actions. So they, they get inputs and then they send back outputs back to the game. 
that takes time in a regular game. It takes a lot less time in an online game. So basically, we are working on um, uh, how to. Uh, thank God, I've got video here. If <laughs> say you got say you got this book, it's got several pages in it. Uh, imagine all these pages being the separate game areas. We can, by having uh, plot control engaged in things, just drive plot straight through all the pages. Um, so something that happens in one part of the game will impact the rest of it through drilling down through layers of, of uh, well, basically control layers or uh, agency uh, layers of, of players. So, uh, and that that takes... With with digital tools, you don't have to run across the room and place a counter on on a specific part of a different map. You can do that in a game, but it requires a lot of runners. It re requires a lot of communication, and digital media just makes that so much easier because something yeah. can instantaneously pop up. If you don't know what that is, I'll just switch the voice channel, check with plot control what the hell is this thing that is in uh, Singapore, and just instantly come back to the players and say, oh, uh, in Singapore, that's a floating garbage island. Um, and then they can then they, they can then instantly interact with that without having to wait for it. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so we're going to go back to the first question that Ed asked then. So the economy module adds a lot of complexity to the game, but obviously stops short of simulating the entire real world economy. Uh, how do you find the right point to stop ramping up the complexity? Um, as soon as it becomes complex for the players, that's when you've gone too far. When players stop uh, interacting with the parts that you've got, if you've got an economy module that people don't dare interact with, then you've gone too far. And the complexity doesn't matter as long as it's not complex for the players. Um, second point would possibly be if it's too complex for control, then um possibly you've gone overboard as well but i'd say it's all about if the players get it and they can interact with it um i don't think there's like a, a proper way to interact there's 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 interaction and all the interaction is probably good in my book yeah Okay, thank you. So kind of moving on to the piece that you mentioned quite heavily for science there. By the way, people, please keep your questions coming for, for Johan. Um, on to the point of tech there. So, and you mentioned it actually in, in the kind of start, the way we could do hybrid games when we get back to doing flesh games. What do you think the, how do I word this? What kind of positive aspects have they brought for you and where do you think we're underutilizing tech still? Um, the flow of information. Um, using tech is about either um, making things uh, clearer and stronger or simpler. Um, I think that equipping um control with some tech tools in a in a flesh game like you have an ipad with a mirror board or something like that um would probably uh speed up the flow of, of information then uh, i've seen some really cool stuff that's not that sort of expensive tech where you can have uh projections map projections rather than uh like a paper map you can have a, a piece of paper and project the map onto it that can then change depending on what goes on in different parts of the game so there's a bunch of, of, of cool stuff like that uh, that of course will upset the puritans who think it's it needs to be like a, a wooden counter that's being pushed by a wooden rod across a, a paper space sure uh, and i'm not saying that's wrong but if you want to move into um newer ways i'm not saying better ways but newer ways more um i don't know innovative possibly ways of of playing games and having um narrative spread uh, throughout a game that sort of stuff if you're into emerging narrative then tech stuff is going to be amazing to do like um I've, I've toyed with the idea of having 
uh, RFID tagged stuff move across maps and and send information to tablets and stuff like that. So so controlling different room can be uh, controlling a different room can be alerted to when something happens specifically on a map that they need to act on, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Because to because time is a big factor and. Um, sometimes especially like for operational uh, parts of games uh, a lot of time is spent waiting uh, and it, you're not waiting for other people to, to decide what to do it, it's you're waiting for the resolution and resolution can be sped up if it's yeah. a calculation if it's um if somebody needs to decide something that, that can be sped up and you can get more game out of the game so to speak so essentially using technology to remove the bits of the game that are essentially busy work. Yeah, I, 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 adds... I, yeah I, I think I think um, Alex Beck's uh, Mirror Shades is a is a good example of uh, if you were to give um, players access to um, something where they can vote uh, on their phones and keep their shares for the companies they invest in on the, their phones instead and you can automate all the calculations that removes one entire control role from from the game and it also speeds up you can have interactivity and you can have like uh, stock prices moving in real time and that's all that sort of cool stuff and that's not really that complex to do and um I, you know most of us have at least one friend who works in tech and if they can't mm -hmm. help you solve a spreadsheet maybe they know somebody who can yeah yeah we've also talked about i remember we had one conversation once i think it was around event horizon uh, about using technology to improve atmosphere of uh, placing speakers around the hall and you have bluetooth yeah. tags when you move past them at certain times if you had a certain thing on your tag it would make yeah. spooky noises which is something i'm fascinated about kind of changing the the kind of physical space uh, yeah. basically to make that work for your for your game as well and yeah, I, and, and I think a lot of ideas are going to come from online mega gaming because of the lack of physical space. A lot of cool ideas are going to come up that haven't been uh, practical in physical space, but that you want to keep uh, and in you need to be creative in order to keep those things. Uh, all the stuff that you can do, do in Roll20 by playing background music, that sort of stuff, depending on what yeah. scene you're in or if it's, uh, you know, you're in a... Um, tavern for a fantasy game or, or if you're on the battlefield or if you're on a spaceship and it's bleepy bloopy stuff in the background that really adds to the to the thing and that is something we should um, be careful about um, not losing when we go back to to uh, meet space games yeah so there's a fascinating stuff just like uh, i'd never seen a, a mirror board before uh online my game started using them all over the space and it's a really nice tool and she's a mm. science game has been used for john keyworth's uh kind of 10 66 type of game so there's fascinating things there and i almost wouldn't want to lose the utility mm. that these things give us in in, in running games and, and basically it's back to if I have more time to go and talk to people and engage in the actual talking part of the game, that will lead to more emerging narratives and lead to more stories for the day. And I think uh, online mega games are starting to become better at picking up narrative th uh, threads than regular games. Ooh, I suspect that will be controversial. Um, yeah, well, so yeah, that's just be, just because, and that is from a. Uh, inclusion standpoint because in 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 uh, and i think if if you think this is controversial then you're a dickhead uh, <laughs> because basically um uh, regular games are driven by and the narrative is driven by the loudest group of players uh and i'm not saying that that is eliminated in any way shape or form in the online format but is it is uh, very much reduced because you you are on a on, on the same level of, of volume um, provided you have like it, your your tech doesn't suck then you're on a similar level uh, you, you can have things moderated in a different way um, than 
a heated argument around a table will always uh, end up in a shouting fest that that can be reduced in the online format plus you can have vote voting is much much easier in the online space whenever whenever we do stuff in in um, um in the online environment we do stuff like uh, quick votes uh, everyone gets to have their say we can source information from different parts of the game that is something that is underused in online games as well where you can pick up all of these things from all players and it's it's a matter of agency i think okay so a, a question here from jonathan i can't see their last name and unfortunately so would requiring a smartphone to play be considered an accessibility accessibility issue and becky that is going to point out not just a smartphone one with charge to survive a, a day of heavy use um yeah i am of the idea since we've run many games in uh, the past regular games you invest in um cards you pay maybe if you print at home you spend your time yeah. uh, but it's it's there's always the cost of materials we spend quite a bit on materials so maybe we have a budget of i don't know almost a thousand pounds for maps and stuff like that that gets if you want to rent tech, that gives you an awful lot of tech for a day. So if people can't bring their own, um, and, and th this is just, I, I I think that's something to solve rather than something to say uh, no, yeah. we can't because n not everyone has access to a smartphone. That can be solved if if like Gothenburg Mega Games would invest in in um, I don't know ten used iPad Minis um, that are four years old. That's not that much of a setback. Uh, if we use that instead of buying maps or instead of buying cards, instead of it's 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 a matter of you have to invest in tech like you have to invest in other stuff. Uh, so, yeah. so I think uh, have it. So, so in that way, I'm addressing the um, the the economic aspects of of everyone being able to play. Then there's the accessibility um, aspects of being able to use a smartphone, but that also goes for being able to move around in the room and and all that stuff that all of us are constantly constantly um trying to figure out how to do in in the best possible way uh table height um chairs no chairs accessibility around the room uh, um, solutions for people who who um have um, um problems um hearing or seeing or color blindness all that stuff that you're already working on this is just another aspect of that yeah so rather than <clears throat> So ask the question or, or basically the proposition of this would be easier if I was using technology that comes up with an issue. How do you solve the issue rather than going right back to the I shouldn't do it because yeah, exactly. there's potentially an issue. Yeah. And and cost is I've actually looked at this before for the game I want to run in terms of cost of buying cheap Samsung tablets. And depending on how long you want them for you you can be talking anywhere from 40 to 100 quid per per tablet yeah, so exactly exactly yeah for a for a group if that's an investment for for a long term strategy it is not an insurmountable cost no, and, I, and, I think i agree with you there maybe like like for instance for for uh, for my job that i do um for for a living i've had to invest in tech now to do online meetings um uh cameras and screens and all that good stuff you you could easily invest in having for, for each team table you have a wireless charger or just electricity run up i think i think that's more of a a problem in the game in some in some venues i've played in in the uk where there's there are no power sockets anywhere in the room um that, of course that's going to be a problem but it's not a problem that should uh, it's not a practical problem that should uh, let you shy away from using technology. That maybe mm. choose a different ven venue or solve the problem. Yeah, venue is an interesting one that we actually talked about on the accessibility uh, panel just before this because 
in the UK, they're they're expensive and out of the way. There aren't that many of them that you can that you can use. So that's a, a different one. So I'm going to completely segue back because this is supposed to be about Watch the Skies, but we'll come back to this stuff, obviously. So your five favourite things from today's game. Um, number one is a personal favourite that we do sometimes. Uh, and the, one of the most amazing things about running games online is we open the server like a week before the game actually starts. So we get a very good... It's like it's like a very, very long cast, casting questionnaire because you get to see the players, how they, they interact, how they reason around uh, different parts of the game, what they, what they want to engage with. So you can, you can use that as a sort of thing to give players what they're after because you can sort of listen into their text conversations and you can have conversations with them. Uh, number one thing was giving... Um, the uh, Japanese team who were very, very keen early on, two days before the, the game, we gave them uh, a report that said they have Godzilla. Please, at the start of the game, come uh, speak to the uh, chief scientist of that project and he'll tell you all about it. And they were all excited. And then an hour before the game, uh, we gave them the news that the uh, underground lab was completely destroyed something happened and an awful accident please tell no one about this we don't know <laughs> where any parts of that project have gone and then godzilla turning up halfway through the game not because we wanted it to because we we hid it somewhere and then the aliens found it and activated it um uh that probably number one uh i i'd say um Number two was the the amount of collaboration between different teams to try and take down America. That was glorious to see, and it just uh, um, in in all small ways just trying to to mess with them uh, until uh, the economy broke and they had to reshuffle and then came back stronger than ever because they knew who were they who they were were facing and they can maneuver around it. Uh, there was some really amazing. Um, we probably played my. We we ran with my favorite uh, alien team. They're very open ended, and they start by probing the Earth for imbalances. So we have a. Uh, I think it's a sixty page uh, folder of statistical data that we're just feeding them bullshit about parking tickets in New York and uh, all everything like from everything so depending on where they probe we can just feed them and after a while it just reaches a, a point of information overload um where they just go okay everything is fucked let's just try and sort this out uh, and then um i think halfway through the game they activated a fail safe that just said maybe the people of earth shouldn't be in contact with anyone <laughs> let's just entertain the option of glassing the planet um, I think that was that was a lot of fun and and just like those are, I I think I'm going to limit myself to those three moments. Yeah, okay, that's an interesting. One. So it's something I'm again I'm straying on to to wider topics. But for America, how how did that team do? If a lot of people spent their day dumping on them, because I'm always concerned yeah, in that, that mega that was, game. That was a problem. I I think. Uh, I'm not sure, um, um, without checking how many games they've played before, we do a casting, casting questionnaire beforehand to sort of gauge the experience. And, and obviously there's a clash of culture when you have, in today's game, we had like probably about half, half of the players were from uh, the UK, the other half from America, and then a couple of strays from the Netherlands and uh, Sweden and somewhere else. Um, but there is a cultural clash between the American way of, of playing mega games and their expectations of what, what a game is and the UK uh, crew. The UK crew is more, uh, I think also uh, goes for all of Europe. We're more sort of uh, brutal in our way of uh, doing role play. Um, and the Americans are more, I just, I would actually use the, the word considerate <laughs> because, because they are they are more considerate of uh, and and I th I think more actually more clued up on on inclusion 
uh, in in the social sphere, uh, I would say, based off of running two games. So this is not scientific in, in any way, shape, or form, but from what we've seen, um, and that I think that caused a bit of tension. But that is for control to handle. You need to have a discussion with that team once you uh, um, once you are aware that that is happening. Um, you need to help them not feel overwhelmed. And I think we did a decent job of catching that. Um, and the fall of the US was done uh, by asking them how they wanted to proceed. Did they want to be the American underdog rising from the ashes or did they want a re-roll or that sort of stuff? And they had like a 15 minute discussion during the, the lunch break on how to proceed and how to have them have a good day because that is in essence what we're there for there the, in in our version of what's the skies there is no preconception of narrative it is what it is and it's based off of players having a good time so that is important so when that happens when a team gets in a position where everyone's dumping on them or or they get nowhere in in the un or they get nowhere in in some some area rather of, of the game you have to engage with that team and see what they want to do as players rather than sticking to what would the what would the US do and you have to do that um, nothing else matters uh, and i think we did a decent job of that not amazing but you can you can it's always hard to catch that in time yeah but you need yeah. to have you, uh, the players need to feel that there is a support group of control yes them up and and not letting uh giving them out yeah that, that that is the thing when you when when you're feeling overwhelmed and everyone's dumping on you and you feel you have no out that is not a good position to be in letting them know that there are narrative narrative outs there are uh, mechanical outs and there are uh, like proper game control outs where we m would move a player or something like that yeah, okay, okay. So I got a question from Andrew here. Johan needs to answer the one question that's on everyone's lips. Tell us about the domes. No. No, no, Andrew, I'm afraid there will be nothing about the domes. There were no domes, <laughs> but at the same time, there were domes. It's, it's, one, of, it's one of those things where, where narrative um, gets a life of its own. You say something to someone and all of a sudden there are domes. Um, and uh, uh, summoning Cthulhu was the same thing. Somebody said tentacles, then all of a sudden uh, um, there was a war between uh, Argentina and Japan. So, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it, it gets a life of its own. The dome's got a life of its own from like turn one, and then players decided to run with it. And it, it you know, it's one of those uh, plot points that comes back to plot control consisting of like six control players going all going what domes there are no domes has anyone mentioned domes and one plot control said i might have said something about there might be domes there and then <laughs> the players just ran with it so i can't i can't explain the domes and like i said uh, no, nothing is pre-generated it's it's all player generated in in the games that we run yeah, I do. I do love it when that happens in games. Random suggestions lead to to comical misunderstandings. Uh, essentially, I believe Watch the Skies Four. I was playing the the head of China. Um, my military player accidentally uh, invaded uh, both Pakistan and India. Uh, Kind of, it's just like I, I didn't tell him to do this, but I did tell him to defend Kashmir, yeah. and it was Chinese Kashmir, so he hadn't technically gone into other areas of Kashmir, but this wasn't taken in quite the way. <laughs> it was uh, so I, I then basically I had the British and the Americans coming screaming at me about invading Kashmir and invading India and Pakistan. Yeah, one, one freedom fighter is another one's terrorist. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, if we got any more questions for Johan, less we talk about Transnistria, the better. Well, we won't yes. talk about Transnistria then. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We won't talk about that. Okie dokie. So uh, let's go to something a bit more general. So what is the trend in mega games that you're most excited about at the moment? 
I'm hoping more people are gonna I'm 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 obviously missed the playtest of today. Um I'm excited about new concepts. I'm excited about what um um lockdowns and being confined to the online space will do to the key points of, that we were facing before the pandemic, which was uh, inclusion and technology, it, it will push us forward. There are some really interesting things. I mean, I'm excited about how hybrid games, uh, interconnected uh, games between different geographical local games, um, and maybe two, two local games, two online games diverge in some interesting way. There's a bunch of really cool creative stuff that you can do. I'm excited about all of it. I'm always excited about the future. So that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So are you working on any mega game designs at the moment? Um, yes. Uh, but they are, uh, and this is, I should take out a, a page out of my own playbook because I've, decided that they're not good for the online format which is probably wrong um and uh, i probably just need to collaborate with the right people and i don't mean techies because um one of uh, the people who have has helped me the most in moving to online is a real techie uh, but some of his solutions are very sort of automation based and my solutions are not that. My solutions are sort of uh, let the players sort it out. Yeah. If, 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 you know, like for, we have an, for What's the Skies now, we run the economy. Um, I would shout out to Kurt, who runs the Den of Wolves thing and the tech that he's based that off of, uh, which allows for transactions in online space, which is really, really cool. Um, I took the easy way out and based it all on an honor system. So you, this is what you start off with sort of economy wise, you handle it, here's some more money. Uh, you basically run your PR sheet off your economy thing. Then you add, go around the game and you, as a player, you add the different bits to your economy. And, you know, it, it's not a matter of was that 19 or was it an actuality 18? doesn't matter it won't really impact narrative it, yeah. that's not the driver of it if if it if it, if, it, if you cheated yourself into 30 megabucks instead of five then sure maybe that makes an impact but you know if people want to cheat you can't really you know in in a regular game uh, people might go over to the uh, control table and take a bunch of tokens and they're the richest people in the game. So good, good for them. If that makes them feel happy, uh, sure. It doesn't do anything, I don't think. Yeah. If, you, if, that, if cheating is the way you want to play games, then, you know, who am I to say? Yeah, I get that. My, my, job, my job as game control is not letting that impact the rest of the day for other players. Yeah, it shouldn't be so easy to break a game that no, and, and like, cash does that no no as, and as ed said um, um when he was asking questions earlier in this session um it's up to us as control to make sure that you know things are in sync and if somebody turns up with 30 megabucks uh, then just let them waste it on something yeah yeah okay and another question from ed do you think there's a possibility for a mega game about designing and running a mega game yes <laughs> Very much. I'm, I'm so much into all these meta games where you where, where is a game about a game in a game um so absolutely yes it will be a very very niche <laughs> crowd I think, yeah i'm not sure we'd get many new players along to that one no but uh, sure that there, there's uh, there, there are board games about going to uh the board game convention in essen so yeah why not <laughs> Why not, indeed? Okay, okay. So, last call for questions before we let what I'm sure is a very tired uh, Johan actually put his uh, put his head down for the night. Any any last corkers in there for anyone? Give him a couple uh, of seconds. But anything you'd like to mention, Johan? Uh, I'm 
hoping to engage in the rest of Megacon. I think it's cool to, because uh, like judging from who's played Watch the Skies, there is like a third of the players have never played a mega game and getting them to uh, try out new games, meet people, all that sort of stuff is absolutely amazing. They would probably not have turned up to a uh, three-day physical event uh, on the off chance of that being anything. So kudos to uh, put f f to Medic Megacon for for running a very inclusive event. Uh, so I'm looking forward to interacting and engaging uh, throughout the uh, throughout the day. Um, so very cool. Um, I regret regrettably won't have a chance to to play any of the games, but uh, um, this running this and the post traumatic stress of having run this it takes its toll so yeah well thank you very much for, for those kind of words thank you very much for, for running a game so uh yes everyone so we've still we've got another podcast uh coming after this which is my game mechanics and where to find them and we've got a packed day uh tomorrow uh where i'm doing a couple more interviews uh with the people running a den of wolves and red planet rising as well so there's plenty still on uh on the docket for for the weekend so brilliant thank you very much for coming along Long, Johanna running a game and answering questions for an hour after a, a busy day and thank you for everyone watching bye bye all bye